Oh, I see the numbers going up. Welcome, everyone. I'm just going to fill the air a little bit. I'm Isaac Zablocki. I'm the director and co-founder of Real Abilities, and we're going to be starting this conversation in just about five minutes. Please make yourself comfortable. Um, we hope you enjoyed the film. Um, I see already, wow, over 70 participants um, have joined, and those numbers are going up fast. Wow, this is like uh, not like our stock market. Um, the opposite direction. And um, we'll just let everybody get settled and then I'll do some housekeeping and we'll welcome everybody. Um, and this is our first time doing this, so this is really exciting. I hope you all enjoyed the film, um, had time to grab a glass of wine and can enjoy a nice conversation very soon. Um, we'll, give it, we'll give it one more minute um, and, and then I'll start our introductions just to make sure that everybody's there and everybody's comfortable. Get used to your Zoom um, spacing. You have you know, the speaker view and you can enter full screen just so you're not distracted by your emails. Um, you have the Q&A button. I'll start telling you a little bit about some of the functions here. The Q&A button is where you can ask questions. If everybody looks at the bottom of their screen and sees the Q&A button, that's uh, where to ask questions. But wait towards after, you know, the moderator will ask a few questions, so don't do it right away. Um, we also ask that everybody really just asks one question at a time. Um, a really one question per person. So we give everybody, as many people as possible, an opportunity. Not everybody will have an opportunity. Um, you also can use the closed caption function if you can't hear me. Um, I hope uh, maybe the ASL can help, but uh, there is a closed caption option and, um, and that needs to be turned on. We are live uh, captioning this. Um, and I want to thank Lauren, who is our sonographer when we're doing this at the JCC in Manhattan, and it's uh, happening here too. Um, I see our number still going up, so I'm going to wait a little bit longer and let everybody kind of join and get used to it before we get started, before I introduce our program. And um, I'm, I'm actually just talking now for those who, who want to know. I'm talking so you're not entering an empty room, you're feeling comfortable. And I'll start to share, and maybe this is a good place to start that for the first time in, I don't know how many weeks it's been already, I stopped counting, but first time in at least three weeks tonight, I felt community for the first time. I felt I was getting all these texts from people who were watching. It worked, it's happening. This is, people were watching all across America and um, definitely all across New York. And that, that, that was a wonderful feeling. And um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed the film. I'm gonna um, start our introductions now and start by just saying about the film that this film, rewatching it now again a little bit, um, made me love Real Abilities films all the more. I don't know if our panelists will all agree with those who are familiar with some of the Real Abilities films. I, I was watching these phony baloney Hollywood movies up there, the, the clips that were being shown, and I was like, wow, Real Abilities films are so different. Their approach to disability is exactly the answer to this film. I'm giving away the ending. Um, so so I, I was really proud to see this film. And I think it is a fantastic opener for this event. And um, we're really excited to have you all here with us. Um, I wanted to start also, this is our housekeeping now is, um, first of all, to start by um, thanking our partners. Our partners um, tonight include, we have many, many partners on this festival and they're often doing the work um, year round and connecting and helping, allowing real abilities really to exist. Um, so we really hope that you'll visit our partner page. Um, I want to thank American Girl, um, and uh, you saw a little clip uh, of theirs before the film. Um, you'll see that before all of our films. I want to thank Vimeo, who's been a partner. Our opening night was supposed to be at the Vimeo headquarters. Um, so I want to give them a big thank you. We put together a lot of efforts. It was going to be a spectacular night, and uh, only second to this one. So um, a big thank you to Vimeo. You were going to have free rides there from Uber. Uber Wave um, is trying to really help the um, accessible vehicles. Um, so check out Uber Wave and, and use that because I think that's something that can really support, um, support our community. And it would have been uh, a really nice way to get to uh, the Vimeo headquarters. I want to give a big shout out to Lights Camera Access, which is going to be running tomorrow. Terry Hartman Squire 
um, is going to be running this program virtually. She also turned the entire program virtually. Um, this is now the third year that she's doing this with us um, and does it across the country in many locations. Um, lights, camera, access a program um, to bring professionals into uh, with disabilities into this industry, which um, is a perfect connection for everything we do. I also want to thank New42. Um, now let me tell you how this is all going to work. I'm going from document to document here. Um, so this Q&A, the way it's going to work is we're going to start, of course, with a moderated conversation. We have really some um, amazing guests with us tonight, and I want to thank them all for being here. Um, as I mentioned before, you could write your questions in the Q&A button. I'll just click on the Q&A button, ask the questions kind of as we're starting to get to the end of the Q&A so you're not repeating any questions. And please, again, only one question per person. Um, not all questions will be chosen. We're going to send them to our moderator who will repeat the questions. Um, if anybody um, cannot use the Q&A button for some reason or um, uh, needs to use a, a voice question, raise your hand. There's a raise your hand button, I believe, and that is how you will cue our moderator to know that, and we will let you know that you were chosen. Not everybody is going to be chosen. Once again, we have, um, I think, at least 100 people on this now. Um, I'm going to remind you that, of course, um, uh, help spread the word and uh, put this online. Um, and don't forget to tag us, um, uh, um, hashtag um, RFF20, Real Abilities Film Festival 20. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel. Um, I'm going to first, um, I think, um, mention Salome. Salome um, Chasnov, who is uh, the director of the film. Salome Chasnov, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm also the writer and producer, um, Susan Nussbaum is here with us. Um, and we have two participants from the film. Um, we have Matt Fraser, actor, longtime friends of Real Ability. He's been here since year one. Um, and the other um, uh, participant from the film is actually gonna moderate our conversation. Um, advocates, um, activists, and, um, and he's actually, he was supposed to be in two Real Abilities films this year, so I'll call him actor as well, um, our good friend Lawrence Carter Long. Um, I'm gonna hand things over to Lawrence now um, to take it from here and to guide the conversation, and we'll see you towards the end of this. Um, I'm gonna make my camera disappear. Thank you, Yitzi. Hello, everybody. This is Lawrence from uh, beautiful Oakland, California. Um, I've been uh, in uh, self-imposed uh, isolation for 17 days now, so it's good to see everybody. Um, um, and it's great to have this event um, as my way to kind of connect with the virtual world outside of the all the work stuff I've been doing on Zoom uh, for the last couple of weeks. Um, I want to start um, with a question for everybody, just so we can test and see how everything's working. I think we'll do it maybe um, by alphabetical order. So the question is, what is your least favorite disability-themed film and why? We had a lot to choose from. <laughs> so um, but what is your least favorite? We'll start with Matt, go to Salome, and then Susan. Wow, Lawrence. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. You know, there are so many to choose from, and there are so many howling examples throughout cinematic history. I think I'm going to go modern, and I'm going to go with every time... No, not... Um, I think I'm going to go with Me Before You, because there was just no need for it. Like, by the time they made that film, everybody who was familiar with the subject matter already knew that this was over, it was finished. It was a, a horrible thematic film in so far as, you know, disabled people's lives are less worthy and that they should kill themselves so the able-bodied person can have the chance of a real life. I mean, it was pretty much everything we're against. But the fact that it only came out like two or three years ago, I think is inexcusable. So that, for me, is my least favorite disability and, film. And I believe part of the marketing was that they were issuing tissues. They were giving people <laughs> tissues on the way into the theater. Right? Oh, my God. Yeah, talk about telegraphing. Oh, yeah. Um, what are you going to get? So, all right, Salome, now that's going to be a tough one to, uh, to yeah. beat. What, what would you say your least favorite is? Well, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't go, I'm not a, like a favorite, least favorite kind of person, but I would say Million Dollar Baby. And, and I and think why? the reason that I hated, that I was so angry with that movie was because it suckered everybody in. People really didn't 
see through it for whatever reason. They, uh, it really, they were, everybody was so heroic. And um, even when we were, well, well, Susan and I will get to our process later, but even in the early days of the salons, people were surprised. And also because it was a lie. That's, it was based on a true story and that's not how the story ended. The story ended, the protagonist became a, an artist, became a painter. She didn't kill herself. So it- uh, She found herself, right? In yeah. Some kind of way. Yeah, yeah, great, great, yeah. So yeah, that's my, my top one. Two, two excellent, excellent choices for really bad disability films. Susan, it's to you. What would you add? Well, some of the really worst ones are my favorites, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you get, you can give us one of those if you want. Okay, although I, I remember very little about this movie. Um, I just, uh, I hated it, I guess, in part because of the title, which was Blind. And it was only called Blind because every other movie about blind people, had the name had already been used. So there was... Um, you know, uh, if you can't see, but I can hear. There was um, <laughs> blink. There was uh, wait until dark. There was um, there were a few more blind kind of movies, and so they always had to use oh, you know, like uh, see no evil, get it. Um, that's my one of many. I I dislike all of them pretty much. Great, and, and so Salome, since you mentioned the, the process and the salons, why don't we start with you and then maybe go to Susan. Tell us a little bit about how the process started and, and what the salons did, what was the structure of them, and, um, and basically how long was that process of gathering information? Oh, wow. The, um, the duration of the process, it seemed like... For Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, I really, that was horrible. Um, the, the problem is my, I have my phone turned off, but my computer is not turned off. Um, anyway, um, I lost my place. So yeah, at the so maybe could we go back to Susan actually? Cause Susan sure. has, she holds the origin story of the movie. And That's I think great. the salon process comes out of that. Susan, the okay. floor is yours. Well, uh, when I became disabled, which was, I was in my 20s, um, I didn't know any disabled people and I didn't really know what to expect. And I remember uh, lying in the hospital and um, thinking on it, what did I know about disability? And uh, I went through all these little, um, kind of note cards in my head about movies I had seen with disabled characters. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but I didn't really, you know, have anything in common with The Hunchback of Notre Dame. That was the purpose of the exercise, right? Was to learn something about being a disabled person. And, um, but then the, the weird thing is that I felt I did know The Hunchback and and there were all these movies, black and white movies with disabled characters. And they were, you know, like Heidi and uh, what was the, you know, Moby Dick and et cetera. And the one that I finally saw would be meaningful for me was um, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. And that's because I saw baby Jane, who was played by Betty Davis, she was very scary, um, beating up her paraplegic sister Blanche, who was played by Joan Crawford. Probably most of the people in this audience don't even know who I'm talking about. But anyway, um, baby Jane was her sister's, her disabled sister's uh, caregiver. And so, I figured that was what I was going to be dealing with for the rest of my life was one baby Jane after another in terms of personal assistance stuff. 
And I was just, I'm glad to say that was not the case. But back then, it was really scary. And I, I've been obsessed with these kinds of movies and their backward imagery ever since. Okay, Tell so me. I yeah, can what would you add? There. Yeah, so Susan had this idea of um, doing kind of a arts-based research or discovery process where we would put together clips of films organized around themes like blind men and women or um, uh, magical little people uh, kill or cure. And we would show these montages in audiences and she and Carrie, another writer producer on the film, Carrie Sandal, would facilitate um, Q and A, and we'd film the Q and A. And um, what and happened? Who were your Who were your audiences in that process? We had a range of audiences. We um, We did one screening at Access Living, which is a center for independent living for uh, uh, disabled uh, people in Chicago, one of the major centers in the country. And we did one at University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. We did We did a few all over. Uh, and very diverse in terms of age and ability and uh, every kind of demographic. And uh, what we discovered, first of all, we were building audience in the process and learning what questions people had and what um, concerns they had. But also we were just, people became so passionate about on the topic, the, the um, conversations, and we were just showing clips. It wasn't even whole movies with the, beginning, middle, and an end. And people became so passionate and they didn't want to leave. And we did this for maybe three years at least. It was a wonderful experience. Susan, do you want to add anything? No, I'm good. And, and how did you decide when it came to the film? I, I, you might have just answered in terms of the clips that you used or the films that you focused on that came out of those, um, those salons? Like you figured out which clips kind of worked best? to illustrate certain concepts and themes? I think it was a little more complicated than that. We, we began by um, zeroing in on the issues we wanted to cover and we chose people to interview. And then I think the choice of movies came last to see what fit in with the responses people gave. We did have some movies that we wanted everybody to see. So we'd have certain fence posts in the editing process. And then there were other things that came out of the conversations you had with all of us. Yeah. 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 And, and, and this was a community funded project, correct? Yes. Yes. We, we tried to get really big grants. We tried very hard over a long period of time. People didn't really get what we were doing. It was a little too snarky, a little too ironic, a little too, uh, yeah, they didn't understand our tone. And I think that was a big problem, but we really had trouble getting grants. So we turned to our community and we raised like in one Kickstarter, we raised enough money to make the film. It was a bare bones budget, but we raised enough to, to make the film. And we're so grateful to our community for making that possible. We owe everything to you. Wonderful. And Matt, I want to go back to basically what started the film. You started the film talking about freaks, right? Which is kind of a, an excellent way to start. And, and why do you think has the breakthrough achievement that, occur, that occurred in Freaks, right? I, it blows my mind to think that that was 88 years ago. No. 88 <sighs> years ago that Freaks came out. Wow. Why do you think that didn't carry through in later years and later films? Oh gosh, that's a tough and impossible one to answer. I mean, it still holds the record for the Hollywood film with the most disabled actors in it, um, but it was swiftly banned, wasn't it? And then not released in America until I think the 60s. Um, and then it was uh, the underground circuit. It was, you could see it maybe at a university or a midnight movie or something right, like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I first saw it under those kind of sort of extra uh, conditions. You know, I had to go to a film club, I think, in Colchester, in, in Essex University in England to see it. And I found it very embarrassing because I wasn't out as a disabled person <laughs> when I watched it. And you can imagine how painful that was for me with all my able-bodied <laughs> mates and that weird character I'd created amongst them. 
trashed in a second by the film. Um, but that was my problem, not the films. Um, why do I think that it wasn't? I mean, I don't know, um, because it was post-Victorian. You know, we look at the history of disability and when time became money and the mechanization of industry was roughly parallel to the time disabled people got saw more as um, burdens rather than contributors, etc. So we can't use that as a, as a reason. Um, it's uh, uh, prior to the Second World War. It's a conundrum to me. Maybe something happened after the Second World War whereby only the fit and able physical specimens were wanted as symbolic representations of the Brit, the American, the what have you. I don't know. That's uh, uh, my imagination thinking that up, but I'm not sure. I think you probably, uh, Solomon, would have a much better idea of that than you, indeed, Lawrence. Yeah, um, well, there was, there, yeah, I think there was an attempt to paint a bit of a rosy picture, right? Even in rehab facilities, everybody getting back to normal, that mm, kind of thing. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. yeah, I think there was a, a sense of doing that. If, if there was one thing, I'm going to ask each of you, I'll go to Salome now. If there was one thing that uh, Hollywood could easily do right now, beginning right now, to improve factors, um, what would that be? What was the one thing you'd really like to see? And, and then two, what do you think is preventing them from doing that? Well, I think there are so many things, uh, and I don't want to steal them all, but- uh, I'll ask the others. Well, I'll, yeah, get, I'll get the same answer. Hiring disabled writers, I think would be key so that the story is told from a disability perspective. I think that- So you'd start there with, with hiring disabled writers? I would start there. And I think okay. the reason it's not happening is because, like so many industries uh, in this country, it's a closed circuit. And so it's really difficult to break in. People okay. hire their friends, they hire people they know. Hollywood, I think, and I think our movie shows it, they look for easy formulas. They, there's so much money invested, they want an, an insured success. So they don't like to take chances. And you have to be really brazen and um, bold to break through that. That's great. Susan, how would you answer that question? And no one ever has broken through that, apparently. Because, um, you know, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't anyone in a position of power want to have this revolutionary idea of showing real disabled people in a movie. I mean, real disabled people as we go about our day-to-day -day lives and uh, have, uh, you know, the whole movie, where the whole movie isn't, or even any of the movie based on one central, like, disabled character that all the other characters bounce off of and, and probably learn lessons from and how you're supposed to be nice and all of that. And um, um, yeah, I think that's. And I also think, if I may, it's, an, yeah. it's, a, it's a continued addiction to the use of the metaphor. You know, disabled people are used as metaphors, um, sometimes not metaphors, just literal, but often the metaphor for stuff. Um, you know, I, as an actor, I've totally noticed a change in the television industry. It's slow and painful and 20 years too late, of course, but I have noticed a difference. And yet Hollywood are holding out. <laughs> it's like everybody else in the industry of creating dramatic drama on screen has realised there's, there's actually a now, there's the disabled pound, the purple pound, as we somehow call it in Britain. Um, you know, we need to be seen reflected in ourselves and other people want that too. And they've done audience analysis and everybody wants the same thing. The reality, that's all we're asking for. And yet Hollywood is still holding out. I think, I think it's a watch this space because I think the walls are crumbling. Television has finally given way. And now it can only be a matter of a short uh, amount of time that Hollywood follows. And uh, I, I would ask us all to watch out for the reactions to the new Mark Wahlberg film, which has Liz Carr in it, in a quite a pivotal and status-driven role. And let's see if that changes anything or begins to change anything. Because up till now, there's a bizarre divide between Hollywood and other forms of, of, of screen portrayal of disabled people, which are now slowly starting to have real experiences and real disabled people, even real disabled writers. So 
it's a conundrum and I can only think, as with most things, it's down to money. Or is there a secret little club of able-bodied actors and like, no, we can't give it back to them. We can't give them what's theirs. I want that award and let's face it, it's the only way I'm going to get it. I don't know. <laughs> they're encouraging, that's the next, that's the sequel. Um, they're, they're encouraging, I think, uh, signs out there, right? Shows like Rami and Special and uh, Devs, I just saw Liz in um, <laughs> just last week. Um, um, I, I, to follow up on that, I'd say, what are you all encouraged by? Salome, what, 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 do you, what do you feel good about in terms of what's happening these days? Is there anything giving you some hope? Yeah, yeah, there, there is. Um, you keep starting with me, I'll just mention that. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, well, I love Chain for Life. I, lo I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, and I love all the fanfare and excitement around Crip Camp. So I think um, there's, people are showing that there's a lot of audience for quality films. Um, and I do enjoy the forays on television. Like there are a lot of um, approaches to disability on, on TV. There's, it's a lot more experimental as Matt said. And, uh, but still there's often an able-bodied actor playing the disabled character. But I would say TV is way ahead of Hollywood. Excellent, Susan? What are you well, encouraged by? I didn't notice that TV was any better than Hollywood, but I'm sure that it is, if you guys say so. And um, I, I am less hopeful, at least for the near future, because, to, you know, this industry is another. It's, it's so, it's systemic. It's so planted in this country. And uh, it's going to be really hard to break into it. And I don't really know that we want to break into it. I think we want to maybe do our own stuff for a while. I, but, could I, could I yeah. say something to that? The, the one thing that is a little bit of a problem, to make your own movie without any support, your um, you know, you're spending years trying to raise money. You're often using your own money. You're, uh, have another job, at least one. And, um, and in the end, although you might have a great audience, you might not make any money from it. So it's really has to be a labor of love and commitment and passion. And the one thing about breaking into the mainstream Hollywood, Hollywood system is you get support making your project and you might come out with enough money to invest in a new project. Okay, and, and, um, with, and this has been a long process. When did you start working on the film? I would say um, 13 years. 13 years, so it's 13 years. So to give people a sense of what it takes, right? What that commitment really is like. Um, Actually, what I would you say, pardon? Should I be embarrassed to admit it? No, no, I don't think so at all. I, 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 interesting, the earlier iterations of the film, you can tell how much time has passed by the difference in my hairstyles. Yeah, so, I was, you know, I, I was 15 years old when we started. <laughs> it's all, but it's also a testament to your tenacity and perseverance, Solomon. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing to be embarrassed about. If anything, it's a badge of honor. Right. I yeah, I think so, right? I understand what we were, we didn't, you know when you enter a process, and you don't really know where it's going to take you. And, and this, the movie went through several evolutions. So it was always a new movie, like every year, oh, it's a new movie. Um, I think we definitely got production tired about two years, right before the Kickstarter. We took our budget and cut it down like 10% um, of the original budget. We said, this is what we're gonna raise. We're gonna make the movie no matter what. We're just exhausted. And that's what brought us to the finish line. And it's hard to be a pioneer, right? By the time you're tired uh, of something, everybody else is just starting to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, which I think is sort of, you know, evidence. We've got a question from the audience. So I want to go to those while we have a little bit of time left. The question is, why do you uh, guys criticize the inspirational disability films, uh, Men of Honor? Isn't there any value to creating inspirational movies like this to inspire 
inspire those of us in the disability community to see these figures as representing possibility when lots of us in the disability community are different spectrums in our acceptance journeys. Is there anybody who feels a burning need to answer that question? If so, give me a, uh, give me a sign, give me a signal. <laughs> Matt, you're laughing, why don't you start? Hey, hey, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with using disability in conjunction with inspiration, with using impairment, uh, because for me, disability is a social construct, impairment in conjunction with inspiration. It's just that usually they get it so very wrong insofar as we're assumed to be lesser. The fact that we want equality makes us heroic, which is in turn inspirational. And all, all it is, is average. <laughs> so inspiration porn, is not good. Yeah, explain you, what that is for, for well, the newbies. Stella Young, everybody who doesn't understand about inspiration, Paul, go to the TED talk by a lady called Stella Young and 14 minutes of excellence will school you in that properly. But basically it's you give me an award because I'm able to tie up my shoelace because when you look at my little arms, you think, oh my God, he can't do anything. And then when I can do a thing, you heap me with undue praise that really just betrays your attitude that thinks that people like me are inferior. So that's all it really does. However, I am waiting for the kind of inspiration. Imagine this, uh, a middle-aged guy, he's got nothing left to live for, comes out of prison, he sees this little four-year-old girl, will you help me find my mummy? But she's from Syria and he's got to, with no money, go to Syria and find the girl's mother. Classic movie. Now make the guy disabled, right? Don't change anything else. It adds something, okay? It adds the, the, the fact that our battle scar uh, way of dealing with life will equip us with the necessary tools to do this. So we're at once inspirational and the only person that could have done. So, so Susan, you, you were very animated there. What, what did you want to add? Well, I was going to say, make, when you make the guy disabled, um, you just don't have to mention it in the movie. Because mm -hmm. really, how many times in a given day does any disabled person really go around thinking about themselves as disabled in that sense or mm. talking about their disability? I don't know. Not, not, it's not the center of who we are. It's, well, yes, no, that's, that's wrong. It's, um, I just want to see a person doing something that's not about the disability. But that's where they get it wrong, the writers, Salome, the non-disabled writers, they get it wrong because they make it about the person's disability. And like you say, Susan, we don't go on about our disabilities. Yeah. Other people notice them and react weirdly, which is where the disability starts. And that's fine to show because that's reality. But I don't go, oh gosh, I don't know how I'm going to come and see you today, so I mean, what with me having short arms and everything, that's going to make my journey really difficult. Nobody talks like that. But if you illustrated that story, right? If they illustrated maybe how difficult it is to open a door or to whatever the things you would face on a day-to-day -day without making it a big exposition, that could be useful. Well, to somebody yeah. going, did you see the way he opened that door? It was so inspirational. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, I think the, the problem here is that, that when people get targeted or get labeled as inspirational by default, right, you get labeled inspirational or you get the violin music when you're just getting out of bed in the morning, right? There's nothing to it. I, I think the problem is that inspiration without perspiration is merely aspiration. That's a lot Ooh. of I In order to actually make it matter, to make it worth something, You've got to do some work. Okay. You've got to change something, right? I think, I think that's the thing. It's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling in the stomach. That could be indigestion. Inspiration has got to compel you to act, to change something. And then, and then maybe you've earned it. Um, so there, I'm off my soapbox. Um, let's see. Um, second question. Do you have an example of when media gets it right in portraying a disability story or a disabled character? Yeah, you have one that comes to mind, each of you? Sure there is one, hold on. There's a pause, a dramatic pause. Yeah, I'm sure there must or be Or mostly one. right, maybe not completely right, but mostly right. Well, ooh, contentious. I'm uh, 
that's not because, sorry, I talk. I, you, I talk too much anyway, please. Oh, okay, well, um, what was the question? I'm so is, is it, Do you have an example where the media gets the disabled oh. character correct? Yes. Something like uh, maybe a quiet place, at, at for example. Part of it. I'm sorry, what? Something like a quiet place, for example. I did like a quiet place very much. And um, I liked that it was, it just felt more real. Even though it was about a monster in the future where you couldn't make noise. Although that is really, it sort of reminds me of where we're at now. I was just glad to see that there are deaf people in the future. Yes. And um, anyway, I did like A Quiet Place, but I'm a blank. Okay. See, that tells you how difficult it is. Um, um, what, well, let's go, let's step back a little bit. What traits would you like to see in a disabled character? Hmm. Um, Do curious. they have to be honorable or can they be a right bastard? Oh, they can be a right bastard. But also, I think um, the kinds of traits that are <coughs> interesting to watch. When a person is uh, someone who actually makes some things happen or sets off a series of events or... Um, is deeply flawed, but that flaw has nothing to do with their disability. Uh, I mean, can you just imagine a watchman for disability? Yeah. Like, oh, well, it's gonna happen. Disabled. They're all disabled anyway. I mean, are you talking about the watchmen, the superheroes? I was talking about the recent TV series, uh, not the uh, Alan Moore uh, graphic yeah. novels. Yeah, the X-Men are all disabled. The Watchmen may, may not be. I tried to get an audition for the X-Men. Didn't get an audition. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's another problem, right? Yeah, Salome. Yeah, I guess what I'm thinking about um, in context of what you're talking about, like the movies that we looked at, you know, over a hundred years of movies and many that we looked at that we didn't show in, in the film that didn't make it. Um, the disabled characters were all extreme to the extent of being stuck. They were all like really evil or really innocent or really overcoming or, you know, they were, they, they were like one-sided one characters. And so not three dimensional. Right. So I, I think that maybe um, what I'd like to see is just somebody that's a complete character that's engaging that I, I want to watch them or know them or know more about them uh, as a character. And, and as Matt said earlier, and the disability is just one aspect and it might uh, affect other aspects. It might not. Right, but it's woven into that tapestry of all the things that that character becomes. Yeah, I, I and, know the, that, and the character's not a stock character, one like a tool, an instrument for something else. But for it's a plot a, device. A worthy device. character in and of itself. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to see more um, characters that are reflective of the fabric of society. I'd like to see disabled characters be the hitman or the hooker or the school teacher, or the bus driver. And, and if, if that was more reflective of, let's say, the 26% that's supposed to be the number of, of disabled people of the total population of the US, I wouldn't care what role Brian Cranston did, right? Because there'd be a lot of disabled actors doing a lot of roles, and Brian Cranston could flex his muscles all he wanted. But we're a long way from that. Um, what are your hopes for the trajectory of the film? Um, what, what, given that where we are right now with COVID-19 and where the world is and all that, what, how, how would you like to see the direction of the film? Yeah, I'm, I don't want to see it buried because of bad timing. And um, that's my main concern about it, you know, but I do think it's going to be looked at with some interest by the 
dis disabled community. And that's gonna be fun to see. And I, I hope also that, um, that there is a new discussion about crit film criticism and the importance of it and how you need to step back from a movie and ask what, what that movie is teaching you. What did the people who made the movie want to say to you? And uh, they must have made it for a reason, or else they didn't. You know? So a deeper, a deeper analysis beyond tragic and heroic, right? Yes, people being able to have more tools when they go to the movies, as instead of just, um, you know, leaving themselves over for more bad propaganda about disabled characters. Disabled. Okay. Salome, anything to add? Uh, well, I, absolutely, I would um, repeat what Susan said. I think also I would like to see interest for the film um, among general audiences. Um, you know, so like there be like a wide, a wide audience for the film, not just people, particularly with disability studies or film studies interest, or you know, kind of an academic interest or an identity interest, but like people that want to know more about the topic. Great. Matt? Just as a coda to that, I agree with uh, what you guys have just said, but I also think that Code of the Freaks would be required viewing for every, anybody doing film studies, because so it's a one-stop shop. Anybody going shop. into uh, film school or anybody studying film should watch this. Right, because it's a one-stop shop about the subject matter. It tells you everything you need to know, breaks it open, has the discussion, makes the conclusions, and young minds about to make cinema who are probably statistically going to be not disabled really need to see that. So I totally agree with both of you, but I also think it would be a good educational tool and surely should be put on the curriculum for film studies. I'm out of Fantastic. it. Fantastic. I think I'll wrap with that. Where can people find out more about the film? I want to give you a chance to send them to a website or, or uh, wherever. Well, we have t uh, two spots I could, uh, Brad. Uh, sorry, talking in the room. Um, two spots. One is codeofthefreaks.com and one is the Kino Lorber site. Kino Lorber is our distributor and they have a page on the film. Okay. And a Facebook That's, page. We have a Facebook, and a Facebook page. page. So the people want to find out more um, and the progress of the film as time goes on and what's happening with it lately, they should check out those places. I'm going to toss this back now to Yitzi. Hi, Yitzi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Salome. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you, Real Abilities. Yeah. Isaac, the yeah. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, we have a big week ahead of us. This is just like a great way to kick it off. And I want to say just here in this conversation that it's very clear to me over the years, and especially this year at Real Abilities, that you can have quality and authenticity together, um, no matter what Hollywood says. This is, this is something that actually go together beautifully and actually bring out better films. And that's why I always find that the Real Abilities films are some of the best films I see all year. And we're really excited to share all these films with you this week. Tomorrow night, um, we are screening Oliver Sacks, His Own Life. And um, uh, please join us for that. We're gonna have a conversation with the uh, director, Rick Burns afterwards. This is gonna be amazing and much, much more to come. So please help us spread the word. Um, I, I'm also gonna push you to check out this conversation is gonna be on our YouTube channel, um, as is already um, what you possibly haven't seen. We have our, um, what we called our red carpet, which was a few words of thanks um, from our co-chairs of, of the festival. And I want to give a big um, shout out to Lynn and Jordana and Michelle who are watching and our amazing supporters. Um, so you could see them there along with our amazing commissioners, um, both uh, Victor Khaleesi, the commissioner for, um, the, for the mayor's office for people with disabilities and also the commissioner of the mayor's office for media and entertainment. Um, they both made some beautiful statements there. So check out our, our virtual red carpet. Um, a huge shout out, I can't go without saying a thank you to um, uh, our honorees at the beginning of the night, um, who hopefully you enjoyed those, that, those moments too. Um, to Malin for the amazing songs, um, to John Krasinski, 
for being a mensch. Um, to, of course, our two honorees, Millicent Simmons, and I hope um, uh, A Quiet Place 2 comes uh, to theaters real soon, and we're all um, free to go and see it. Um, and, of course, to Zach Gottsig. And how do you guys all like um, uh, The Peanut Butter Falcon? What do you guys think of that one? I haven't seen it yet. Me neither. Thumbs up. Big fan. I'm really looking forward. Oh. Um, there's, there's a... That, that is just one little piece of the revolution that's going on right now in cinema. Matt, you want to say something? No, I was apologizing to Brandon because I spoke over you and for our deaf and hard of hearing audience, that's really annoying. So uh, that's the BSL sign for sorry, so sorry. Um, thank you. And um, folks, check out our Facebook, check out our Q&As on YouTube. Join us here all the, every night of this festival. We're here until um, April 6th with many fantastic films. I want to thank uh, Salome, Susan, Matt, and Lawrence, of course. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here tonight. Everybody stay safe, um, wash your hands, stay at home, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in real life soon. Thank you very much. Yes, I. Thank you. Thanks all.